Right, hopefully we are now live. Um, so, hello everybody. Welcome back to another edition of our Quarantine Thermo uh, seminar series. Um, thanks for, for, for joining, joining us. Um, we're very excited this week to have um, Professor Brantou um, presenting his experimental work. Um, before I get on to that, let me just make a couple of announcements. Um, so um, I think there may be quite a few people who haven't um, joined us for any of these talks before, so I'll just give you a couple of words about the format. So basically, um, we're going to have um, the speaker speak interrupt, uh, sorry, mostly uninterrupted, and then we'll have questions at the end, um, moderated by me. But this, this week, um, what we're going to do is we'll have like a break about halfway through the talk, after about 20 minutes or, or half an hour or so, um, so that Jean-Philippe can answer any of your questions and, and check that, that everyone is kind of up to speed and, and following what's going on. So um, even more so than usual, if you do have any questions um, that occur to you at any time, please just write them in the YouTube chat window, uh, okay? And then I'll pick them up um, at the break and I'll, I'll relay them to Jean-Philippe and then he can, he, he can answer them. Uh, and then we'll do the same thing, of course, at the end of the, the talk as well. So if you just think of any question or you're, you're confused about anything, please just uh, write in the YouTube chat um, and we'll, we'll, uh, I'll relate that to, to Jean-Philippe. Um, so, um, yeah, and as always, just thanks very much for your continued support and please do continue to kind of share and, and, and publicise this, this series of seminars. Um, so let's get on to science. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome Professor Brantou. Um, many of you, I think, will probably be very familiar, uh, certainly in our kind of community of thermodynamics and transport. Um, people are very familiar with his pioneering work on um, DC transport measurements with cold neutral atoms. I think this week he's going to tell us about something a little bit different, more in the kind of cavity QED direction. Uh, so he's going to talk about strongly interacting fermions, strongly coupled with light. So thanks very much, Jean-Philippe. Go ahead. Okay, so thanks. Um, hello, everybody. Um, and let me, before starting, thank Mark for the invitation. It's, it's really a pleasure um, to uh, present our work. Um, and thanks also to all of you who are uh, following. So I'm indeed going to talk about uh, strongly interacting fermions, strongly coupled with light, uh, which is a new experiment which we have started a couple of years ago um, at EPFL in Lausanne, uh, in Switzerland. And, and basically, uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to, to explain you in particular what you see in this picture, uh, which is our high finesse cavity in which uh, the experiments are actually taking place. Uh, but before I do that, and since I, I realize that, that perhaps some of you are not completely familiar with ultra-cold uh, quantum gases, um, I will start from a very general introduction, and, and I apologize in advance for the people for whom this is, this is actually uh, bread and butter, but, but perhaps that, that's actually uh, helpful. And, and even before starting with, uh, with actual ultra-cold atoms, I would like to, to, to give a few general considerations, uh, starting from, from a feeling I have now, which is simply that, that we live very exciting times uh, in quantum physics. And in particular, because this is, these are times of, of kind of unification in some sense, where different branches of physics, uh, in particular, condensed matter physics, uh, but also um, atomic physics, statistical physics, and even recently high energy physics, um, kind of find more and more uh, common concepts and common language to describe their objects. And that is something which is a result of, of tremendous theoretical and conceptual efforts over the last, I would say, 20, 30 years. Uh, and it's, it's actually even more exciting now because, because we are seeing uh, a convergence, not perhaps a unification, but, but a really interesting convergence also from the uh, technological side. That is from the point of view of experiments and actual devices and systems we can, uh, we can manufacture. Um, so uh, I would like to focus here uh, on two aspects. Uh, first is if you think about condensed matter physics uh, and you start from this side, I'm not a condensed matter physicist uh, myself, but I really see in particular striking from the outside how this field is now evolving with really more and more controlled, better and better materials um, and devices now, which, which on the one hand are technically very complex, 
but are so pristine in particular in terms of quality um, that you can um, actually realize functions and, and uh, operations that were thought to be uh, the realm of atomic physics in the past. And if I need only to cite one example, it's of course the uh, superconducting qubit, where 30 years ago uh, it would have been completely unthinkable to actually do cavity QED experiments in the completely in, in the in the solid state um, uh, context. Uh, I picked up here a few examples. Uh, I will not go through them in the details. This is of course a personal pick. This is not meant to be uh, really representative. Uh, but I think it illustrates the, the kind of development that we are seeing. So that's, that's of course, uh, one direction uh, from the condensed matter physics side. Uh, on the other side, we see really a, a, a conversely something which is a convergence from atomic physics, uh, which used to be the realm of isolated gases, single particles, simple systems with very high precision measurement like spectroscopy, atomic clock, and so on. And we really see this field um, in growing in complexity and starting to be able to investigate phenomena which we used to associate with condensed matter physics like superfluidity, magnetism, or uh, mesoscopic devices, which, which as, as Mark uh, was kind enough to, uh, uh, to notice, um, I, I personally contributed uh, to that. So uh, what our experiment is doing is, is basically trying to explore exactly this frontier um, with, with, with two ingredients. The first ingredient is single photons and high finesse cavities, which is a traditional tool of quantum optics. That's one of the systems we understand best. And we wanted to associate that uh, with strongly correlated fermions, uh, which is the system on the atomic physics side that is as close as possible to condensed matter physics. And the idea is really that uh, by, by putting together these tools, we might be able to really explore this interface here, where we have on the one hand interesting quantum phases, uh, some of them perhaps not really understood, and on the other hand, the, the best tools of quantum optics, uh, which is the high finesse cavity. So this is the uh, um, sort of the framework. But before I come to the details of uh, our experimental setup and the kind of experiments which were, should actually be going on at EPFL, should we not be all locked out of the lab, um, I would like to start with a few words about ultra-cold atoms themselves. And, and this is really introductory, so uh, in a f I will just spend a few minutes for the benefit of those of you who are not really familiar with that. Uh, I will just, just describe the most salient features. Um, and the first most important feature, perhaps, which we perhaps tend to uh, forget from time to time, is the fact that ultra-cold quantum gases um, are extremely dilute systems. We work with, with densities of particles, which are uh, typically of the order of one atom per cubic micrometer. That has a fundamental consequence, which is that the interparticle spacing or the Fermi wavelength, uh, since we will be dealing with fermions, is of the order of the wavelengths of visible light. And as a result, uh, we can use optical methods, so microscopes, lasers, and so on, um, to observe and to manipulate these atoms at the smallest microscopic scale. Uh, and one example, again, I picked up from my own uh, work, uh, but this is by no means the only case. Um, this is a system which we've studied a couple of years ago with my colleagues at ETH Zurich, and where we've created um, a mesoscopic quantum wire in the single mode regime, and on top of it, we've created scattering barriers arranged uh, in a lattice where we could actually observe uh, uh, quantum interferences. So this is an illustration of these optical manipulations. And if you ever enter a cold atoms lab, you will see tons of lasers all over the place. And this is really uh, the reason why, why, why this field is actually booming now, is, is this ability to manipulate atoms at short length scale. Uh, and the second very important feature is that, uh, of course, atoms are actually neutral objects. But they interact, and they interact by the, uh, the van der Waals interaction. The van der Waals interaction originates from the fact that uh, atoms can be polarized, and how this happens depends on the internal structure of the atoms. 
The atoms are complex objects. Um, they have a lot of internal degrees of freedom. And when you put two atoms together and think of the way they interact, um, basically the, the bottom line of this interaction is the presence of a molecular structure. The van der Waals interaction gives rise to bound states. Um, and, and we can use external fields, typically magnetic fields, as you will see, uh, in order to change the way these particles interact with each other using the fact that the molecular structure reacts to magnetic fields. And to make a long story short, if you choose a species such as, such as lithium-6, which is the one uh, we are working with uh, in my lab, you have for particular uh, uh, internal states a scattering resonance uh, for interatomic collision which takes place around the field of uh, 832 gauss. So you place the atoms in such a field and this is a, a regime where the atoms will interact very strongly with each other. So that means that we can uh, take our quantum guesses um, and study the way interaction affects their properties, everything else equal. And this is something which has been uh, going on in our community for the last years. Um, we have heavily studied the region of strong interaction. That's the region around the scattering resonance itself, in which, for example, the scattering mean free path is of the order of the interparticle spacing. And this strongly correlated regime is something we can very easily access. We do it on a daily basis. And that's uh, perhaps what makes these ultra-cold Fermi gases very interesting tools to, to investigate strongly correlated systems. So the problem of this uh, uh, unitary Fermi gas, that's the gas you prepare right on the resonance here, has been heavily studied in the past. We know really a lot of its properties now with pretty good precision. Um, I just summarize here a couple of these properties which are interesting for the uh, um, the studies which I will report on. For example, we know that uh, the system forms Cooper pairing at sufficiently low temperature and becomes uh, superfluid. The critical temperature is known uh, with pretty high precision now. It's now of the order of 0.18 times Tf. Um, this, when the system is prepared on the scattering resonance, um, it has scale invariance because uh, as the scattering length diverges, there's no intrinsic length scale associated with interaction anymore. So it has the same scaling properties as, a, as an ideal gas. Um, and a last property which is, will be important, and I will come back to that later, is the fact that um, the short distance and short time physics in this kind of context is also universal in the sense that it's controlled by a few set of uh, functions which can be calculated once for all uh, for all systems of this kind. Uh, and in particular, I will emphasize later the role of TANS relation. There is one parameter which controls how the system behaves in this short-run regime, and that is something which, uh, um, which is a remarkable property of this uh, strongly correlated gases. So um, the main message here is that uh, you can think of this Fermi gases as a very highly controlled quantum material. It's a quantum material because it has a superfluid phase transition, Cooper pairing, and so on, as a regular condensed matter material may have, uh, but it's very well controlled because we have access to most of the microscopic parameters and we can control them from outside. And what I would like to uh, discuss in this presentation is, is the ability we are trying to develop now in my group uh, to basically extend this to control, uh, but control using quantized fields themselves. If you use, instead of an external field um, to address, for example, the interactions or the pair correlations, uh, you, you don't use a classical control, but a quantized photon field, the, the photon field of a cavity, where you have fluctuations, where you have, um, for example, quantum limits uh, to measurements, uh, what can you do? And I will report on this exploration that has started in my group, uh, and it's, it's actually quite promising. Um, so, Perhaps I can now uh, um, take a, v a very short break before I embark to more technical details. If there are uh, some questions or remarks on that stage, uh, I can perhaps take them now. 
Okay, cool. Uh, that's, that's brilliant. Thanks very much. Uh, there's a little bit of a delay, so we, maybe we just wait for a, a few minutes and see. I just wrote something in the chat window to encourage people um, so far. Ah, yes. Okay, great. We've already got a question. So we have a question from um, uh, Wen Chao Zhu. Um, what is the intuition that the superfluidity can happen at 0.2 times the Fermi temperature, which is much higher compared to solid state systems? Um. Thanks for this question. Uh, you can think of the unitary gas as, as having an interaction that essentially is as strong as permitted by quantum mechanics. Um, so basically, now you, you, you take this system, it's on the one hand scale invariant, so it's, it's like an ideal gas, so the only um, intrinsic energy scale you have is the Fermi temperature. Um, and on the other hand, you have very large interaction. So you know uh, by simple dimensional analysis that, well, the critical temperature will be a number, perhaps of order one uh, times the Fermi temperature. This is indeed extremely high. It's actually a question which, as far as I understand, is not completely settled whether it's actually an ultimate limit or whether it's actually it would be possible um, to, have an e to have an even higher critical temperature. And as far as I know, it's not completely obvious. And at least for me, it's not really obvious how you would actually do that. Um. Thanks. That's really interesting. Um, so, guys, if you have any more questions, um, please stick them in the chat window now. Uh, otherwise, I guess it, it will give it like a minute and then maybe we can uh, continue if there are no more questions. Um, so there's just a bit of a delay, you see. So... Uh, Sure. Okay, then perhaps I... Yeah, I'd, I'd say maybe I just continue what? at this point. Thank you. Good. Thanks, Mark. Um, so, so this is the outline of what I'm going to, to talk about now. Um, I'm going to describe in quite some details the, the experimental setup which we are uh, which we have now uh, uh, in our lab at EPFL and our first result, which is basically the observation of strong light matter coupling between one of these strongly interacting Fermi gases um, and light. And then uh, I will come to a topic which is uh, which is actually going on in the group, which is the uh, study of fermion pairs using similar cavity QED techniques. And I will show you some preliminary results, uh, which have been uh, the research has been interrupted by the uh, uh, the COVID nineteen outbreak. Uh, but these are uh, I think really exciting, uh, and we hope to to go on with that soon. And then, if time permits, um, I will show you one example of application of this framework, uh, where you have, again, fermions coupled with cavities, uh, where uh, we've shown uh, that uh, there exists actually a, a natural quantum limit to how accurate you could ever measure an atomic current. Uh, and that is something which uh, emerges naturally when you think of these atoms coupled with light. Uh, but uh, I would like to present this to you uh, in particular because the setup we have developed might actually be able to approach and saturate this limit to really realize an interesting uh, quantum simulation for transport measurements. That will come as a last point. So let me start now with, uh, with the experimental setup. Um, and I, I would like to start by saying that uh, essentially the main thing we, we've done is putting together two pieces of physics. One is strongly interacting fermions, so that the techniques are pretty standard to, to produce these gases. And the others are cavity QED, which to some extent is also heavily studied in quantum optics. Uh, but but the, there are difficulties which arise when you just try to, to technically combine the two, and I'm going to describe this uh, uh, in, in, in a little bit more detail. Sorry, I will not spend too much time on the, the technical aspects, but I would like to give you a flavor um, for, for, for how it is. So what you see in these, these pictures here um, at the side, you have the uh, um, pictures of the actual system as it is uh, in the lab. You have, um, so I perhaps I wait until the, uh, <laughs> the slides actually showing up. Um, but what you see is basically a high finesse cavity. So we have two mirrors uh, facing each other. Uh, they are separated by about, about four centimeters. Um, these are very highly ref high reflectivity mirrors. And these two are at the center of our experimental chamber. 
So in between these two mirrors, uh, we are actually uh, producing degenerate Fermi gases. Uh, so we are uh, performing cooling stages, which I'm going to briefly outline later. Um, so the main player, of course, of this experiment is the cavity itself. Um, I'm going to show you now a few numbers uh, for uh, the properties of these cavities. Um, I guess the the, the technical uh, aspect of this, the exact value, are probably not uh, uh, completely of interest to you unless you, you are indeed working in that field. But I want to illustrate one particular aspect. So the cavity um, is resonant at different wavelengths. Uh, there are wavelengths for which it is used essentially to trap atoms. Uh, but the most important one is 671 nanometer, because that's the wavelengths of photons that are directly resonant with lithium atoms. And there, um, the, the properties of the cavities uh, are listed here. And the most important of these properties is the cooperativity. And if you've never uh, done cavity QED before, there is a very nice and intuitive interpretation for this number. Uh, if you imagine that you put an atom inside your cavity and you put it in an excited state, right, and you wait until the, the atom actually decays and performs spontaneous emission, what the cooperativity is measuring um, is the, um, the, rate at the ratio between the probability for the photon to go out of the, um, to, to be emitted in free space divided by the, uh, uh, so, so that's, sorry, the, the probability of the, sp of the emitted photon to be in the mode of the cavity versus the probability uh, of the photon to be emitted in free space and be lost. So if your cooperativity is larger than one, um, then basically uh, you enter the so-called strong coupling regime uh, in which the dominant in light matter interaction is with one particular mode of the electromagnetic field, right? Uh, so cooperativity of two is, is what we have achieved in the experiment. This is by no means a record uh, in any respect, uh, but this actually means that we can hope to be operating in a regime where uh, light matter is completely dominated by the cavity. And I will show you later that we can, we can, we can indeed see that. So uh, cavity QED is a quite venerable uh, field of physics. Uh, there has been really extensive studies in all kinds of contexts. I just want to briefly mention a wide variety of, of experiments that have been conducted in the past, um, in particular experiments using single atoms. Rydberg atoms are very famous uh, uh, because of the Arroche experiments, uh, but also ions, uh, molecules, quantum dots and uh, circuit QED, semiconductor systems, so all in the solid state context, and ultra cold atoms as well, in particular, um, either atoms at, at uh, uh, at non-degenerate temperature, so laser-cooled atoms, in particular now in the context of atomic clocks, this is being heavily investigated. Um, in particular, over the last 10 years, there has been uh, also investigation of quantum degenerate gases uh, and Bose-Einstein condensates. Uh, so about 10 years ago, um, the first realization of a condensate in a, in a cavity QED context uh, was reported. And now these bosonic gases have been extended to different flavors, such as uh, spinor condensates or uh, lattice gases that have also been uh, investigated. But so far, uh, the, the interacting fermions or even just uh, fermion, uh, fermionic atoms had never been uh, uh, studied in this, uh, uh, in this cavity QED context. So uh, that's the first ingredient, that, that's our hyphenous cavity, which, which I have presented to you. Uh, now, um, the second ingredient is, of course, that, that we have to, to bring the atoms there, we have to cool them down, and we have to control the way they interact with each other. I remind you of this curve here, uh, which is the, the fishback resonance for lithium-6 atoms, which occurs at magnetic field of 832 Gauss. Uh, and there you have to combine technically the hyphenous cavity with its vibration damping system, uh, length regulation, and so on, together with the ability to put strong magnetic fields. Um, and for that, we have developed um, uh, new types of electromagnets with an original fabrication technique. Uh, if you're interested in the technical aspect, feel free to contact me or check our uh, technical paper, uh, which I, I mentioned in the slide. Um, I will not say much more about this, but but um, I just want you to, to to have a flavor of the fact that this is quite a, a quite a technological challenge. 
Uh, and once we have this, uh, so we have our, our cavity sitting in the vacuum chamber, we can start to, to produce these gases. Uh, so basically what, what we are doing is, is we laser cool the atoms and then we capture them inside the cavity. Um, so there should be now a small, small movie. Um, and we, we capture them inside the cavity. And once they are here, uh, we crank up the magnetic field, we reach uh, the phaseback resonance, and uh, once we are at the phaseback resonance, uh, we can actually perform evaporative cooling. So uh, this cooling procedure proceeds in, in several steps. Um, so what, what we get at the end is trapped uh, inside the cavity in between the two mirrors, uh, a very cold quantum degenerate Fermi gas. And that Fermi gas consists of two internal states of lithium atoms and these, uh, these two hyperfine states are the ones which uh, interact with each other via the phaseback resonance. Uh, and, and we can characterize this uh, once we cool it down below the critical temperature, we can observe the onset of superfluidity. Um, this is something we have uh, obtained a little bit more than, than a year ago in my group. <coughs> Uh, and what you see here is one possible manifestation of this, which is the formation of, of a molecular Bose-Einstein condensate um, here uh, for low temperatures. The, the numbers roughly to have in mind is that we have around 200,000 atoms that are equally distributed between two hyperfine states. Um, and, and we cool the system to as low as we can, which means uh, below 0.1 times the, the Fermi temperature. Um, for very low temperature, it's actually not so easy to measure it anyway. But that's roughly the house numbers. And, sh and, and certainly at these temperatures, the system is, is in the superfluid phase. And once we have here, the, um, once we are here, the first thing to try is simply to check that uh, with this uh, system produced inside the cavity, we are indeed in the strong coupling regime. Uh, so to do that, we perform uh, transmission spectroscopy. Um, so I remind you here of the energy level of, of lithium. Um, for the expert, we are working in the passion back regime, uh, so which means the magnetic field is very strong, and that, that sort of makes our life simple regarding selection rules in particular. Uh, but the main thing to remember is that we have indeed two different states which are populated. Uh, these two are spectroscopically resolved, so they are separated uh, by uh, the hyperfine splitting. I call them up and down, so red and blue, if you want. Uh, and these two states, they are coupled with light, and, and they make transition to some excited states uh, uh, here. And, and these three levels are the only ones you need to care about. We have two degrees of freedom, so we will perform spectroscopy as a function of two different uh, detunings. Uh, we can put our cavity, so uh, detune our cavity with respect to the atomic transition and scan the cavity length. Uh, and once we have fixed the cavity length, we can also, of course, scan the probe laser and check where the transmission resonances are. Uh, I make this, this story short, but this is the kind of result we get. Uh, so what you see here, or uh, what you will see, uh, is that uh, we have a two-dimensional map. Every point on this map is a transmission uh, of the cavity at one particular value of these two parameters, so detuning with respect to the cavity and the tuning of the probe. So uh, the, on, on this map, uh, so uh, let's go step by step. If we had only the atoms and no cavity, you would see resonances organized along this uh, dashed line, so the red one and the blue one. Uh, separated, uh, so separation between the two is the hyperfine splitting. Uh, it's 80 megahertz in our experiment. Uh, and that's it. That's what you would see. Right? So if you had just the atoms, you would see that. If you had the cavity without atoms, you would see transmissions organized along horizontal lines. Right? You would see uh, a, a line at zero, which re it basically represents just the transmission of the cavity, uh, Lorentzian transmission, uh, without any effect uh, of anything else. And now, once we put the two together, uh, the optical excitations that we have there are dressed states, and these dressed states, they give rise to an anti-crossing, and you have different branches here. You see one branch above, uh, which shows a very nice anti-crossing between the uh, cavity uh, and the atomic transition. We have one dressed state in between the two atomic transitions, and we have a bottom branch, which also represent dressed states uh, uh, 
between the cavity field uh, and the atomic excitation. This anti-crossing feature is really the fingerprint of strong light matter coupling, uh, which we have now here uh, realized uh, for the superfluid Fermi gas. There is much more structure in this plot. Uh, in particular, uh, you see uh, a lot of extra resonances for negative probe cavity detuning, so in the regime between zero and minus hundred. Uh, and this is, these are things which we understand pretty well. Uh, with they, they come from different transverse modes of the cavity, uh, which are also coupled with, uh, with the atoms. Right? Uh, so our cavity has modes uh, everywhere. It does not only have one. Uh, and, and it turns out that we have families of transverse modes that are coupled uh, with the atoms uh, for negative detunings. This is something we understand pretty well. So uh, we made a very simple light matter interaction model. Uh, which captures that, which accounts for these higher transverse modes. Uh, and you see the result here, there's no fit parameter. Everything is, is calculated from first principle, including uh, the single atom, single photon coupling strength. Uh, and you see a, a pretty good uh, qualitative agreement. Uh, at least all the, the main features of the, uh, the higher transverse mode coupling is, is captured, uh, and also the relative uh, weight of the, of the different branches are also nicely reproduced. We can check a bit more quantitatively how this works. So what we did is we, we, we checked the, the, the location of these uh, dressed state resonances as a function of atom number. Uh, so we choose one particular point uh, here on this graph, so one particular detuning for the, the, the probe laser and the cavity, and we just follow this branch uh, here as a function of the uh, total atom number. And what we see is what we expect, that is its case like the square root of atom number. There are different flavors of the theory which we can use to interpret the data depending on whether or not we account for the higher transverse mode. But these are things which even quantitatively um, are pretty much uh, under control. Uh, and that's, that's, of course, very, a very nice starting point because that means that even with a relatively complex system like the, the strongly interacting Fermi gas, we really keep the very nice understanding of the light matter interaction um, that can be quantitatively uh, compared with the, with the experiments. So now uh, I would like to switch to the second topic, which will be a little bit quicker. And in particular, I would like to come to the actual effect of having interactions. If I, if I show you back um, this plot uh, where uh, you have the map, so I think you, I'm talking, but I think you still see the map now uh, on your screen. So yeah, so, so I'm going to switch to the, the point where interactions uh, come in the game. Uh, and if you look at this, uh, back at this map, you will see that there are uh, extra features which I didn't explain. Uh, and these features you see here, um, they are this sort of uh, uh, weak resonances or, or features wh which, which seem to appear. I'm pointing uh, at them now, so I, I hope you, you can see them. But they, what, what they seem to indicate is that there is like a uh, weak atomic-like transition uh, which seems to be located uh, at negative uh, atom cavity detuning. And, and of course, this is something which is extremely surprising uh, because one thing which we know for sure is the spectroscopy of lithium. And we know that there are no actual states of lithium there. Uh, so, so, and this is not something that's just an accident. If we extend the scan of this atom cavity spectrum over a much wider range, like if we cover uh, 20 gigahertz, uh, we recover, of course, the full spectrum of, of lithium atom uh, without any real surprise. Um, so for the expert, we see the D2 and the D1 transition of lithium uh, exactly where they should be for the polarization and field we have. But we also see all kinds of weak resonances all over the place uh, in between these resonances uh, when we go red detuned. Um, so this forest of peak, uh, they cannot originate from single uh, uh, fermionic uh, atom, uh, single lithium atom. So where do they come from? Uh, what we think is, is that uh, they come actually from the two atom spectrum. So I, I'm going to show you now a very simple picture. Uh, and I hope this is going to work. Uh, if there is some lag uh, at your place, uh, it might seem weird. But 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 think think of two lithium atoms, right? Uh, they are at a certain distance from each other, and you send light uh, that's resonant with this transition uh, onto the onto the atom, right? So what you're going to see is that uh, well, 
when you send, uh, uh, if you if the the, um, the light is weakly saturating, one of the atom can absorb uh, a photon, the other or the other atom uh, can absorb a photon. So what's going to, to happen is that you have these two possibilities, either the first atom absorbs or the second atom absorbs. Um, but uh, what when, when you have one atom in the excited state and one atom in the ground state, these two guys can actually exchange photons with each other. Basically, the excitation can go from one uh, to the other. If you, if you know a bit of Rydberg atom, for example, this is a mechanism that's very well known. Uh, and, and what this gives rise to is to an attractive interaction. Right? This photon exchange uh, mediates uh, an attraction, and as a result, uh, there are actually bound states in this attractive potential which actually correspond to molecular bound states. Uh, and, and since uh, the potential is attractive, these bound states are located uh, below the bare atomic resonance. So if you look below the resonance, I show you here one example uh, for lithium atom. So I think historically this, this work uh, done by Handy Hewlett, uh, where indeed the, the, this, is, this is represented. So that's why below this, this 2s to 2p resonance, we are actually expected to see uh, uh, some of these uh, this, this, uh, these weak lines. So this is what we have. It's actually the two atom spectrum that's called photo association. Uh, and if we look actually carefully and, and, and take a, a detailed scan of the, uh, our experimental data close to these resonances, what we observe is that actually we are seeing strong coupling on these transitions as well. Um, I show you here one example when we zoom onto one of these transitions and you very clearly see the anti-crossing pattern and this is to my knowledge the first time uh, that uh, one can do actually quantum optics and photo uh, and, and strong coupling onto this photo association transition and for that reason uh, we like to call these excitations uh, pair polaritons um, simply because uh, if you have dress states uh, in the atomic context or even in the solid state context uh, we like typically to call them polaritons but now we are talking to pairs of atoms. Um, and, and now uh, I, I will skip relatively quickly through the, uh, uh, through the calculations. Uh, what I show here is basically the light matter interaction Hamiltonian. But I, what I want to outline is the fact that this uh, light matter interaction now deals with uh, fermion pairs. So you kill a photon, you kill an atom of spin up and an atom of spin down, and you create a molecule uh, and with a form factor or an, an orbital that's described by the function f. Uh, so that that's the elementary process. It's a very simple model uh, of what this uh, uh, this process can look like. Uh, and if you go on based on this light matter interaction Hamiltonian, it's very simple to actually derive what the Rabi frequency, so what the splitting uh, we observe in the in the pair polariton spectrum should be. Uh, and you, you realize that the Rabi splitting uh, should simply be given by the short range two body correlation function. So uh, you need, within a few reasonable hypotheses, so it's theory even I can do, uh, you, you realize that, that you are actually measuring directly on the optical spectrum uh, the pair correlation function. And if you remember the first part of my talk, the pair correlation function, the short range physics of the unitary Fermi gas is actually universal. So uh, not only are we now addressing with single photons the pair correlations, but we are actually directly looking at universal many body physics. And it's not something that depends on the details of which transition, which polarization and which atom I'm actually looking at. And technically this parameter uh, this universal parameter is written C and it's called TANS uh, contact. And those of you who are familiar with cold atoms will probably know about that. Uh, so this is something exciting. Um, and just to confirm that indeed these transitions, the, this, this pair polaritons are many body phenomena. Um, what I, I show you now is the, uh, um, the, the, uh, the way this uh, resonance actually changes when we change the interaction strength. Uh, and I, I, I only show you three examples here. Uh, one situation in which we have very strong pair correlations where we are forming molecules. Um, so that's uh, what we call BEC here. Uh, here, if, if uh, pairs are actually very tightly bound, uh, the coupling on this photo association line is very large. And this is what we see here. The contact is very large. And we see that it uh, goes down gradually 
as we decrease interaction, as we as we go to unitarity uh, and 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 to the BCS side of the resonance where interactions are uh, are, attra are attractive, uh, and the contact is actually going down. So this is something which uh, we are studying right now, uh, and hopefully we will soon uh, have quantitative measures of uh, how this uh, uh, coupling strength is evolving with interactions or with temperature and, and will be in position to compare this with theory. But what I find really exciting here with these preliminary results is that we can now really do quantum optics uh, sort of with uh, single photons coupled directly to pair correlations in a strongly correlated system. And that, that is something which, uh, uh, which offers a lot of, of perspectives. So, um, now I, I will come to the last uh, point I wanted to, to share with you, which is a slightly different topic, or, or perhaps actually a slightly different point of view uh, on the same kind of physics. Uh, and, and there it's, it's going to be more of a, of a theoretical proposal, but as you will see, it's, it's strongly connected with the experiments uh, I was discussing. And, and so uh, what, this, what, what I'm going to discuss now is how one could apply this coupled cavity atom system to transport measurements. Um, and and I, I showed you uh, uh, at the very beginning that I've been working on transport for, for a couple of years uh, before starting my group at EPFL. Uh, and there uh, we spent a lot of energy in measuring the, uh, uh, the conductance uh, of mesoscopic structures made of cold atoms. I'm not going to uh, present this to you in great details. Um, uh, I'm not going to, to go through the, the, the technical aspects, but I would like you just to, to grasp the fact that measuring transport for atoms is actually not so easy. Uh, and what we have done is developing this, this two terminal system in which we take a cloud and we shape this cloud into two terminals that are connected by uh, some mesoscopic channel which we want to investigate. And there we measure conductances and we've measured also thermal power or all kinds of transport coefficients simply by, by having atoms go from one reservoir to the other and just um, well, um, just counting uh, how many atoms make their way through the channel by, by just simply measuring the total population that I have on one side versus the other. Um, and again, these structure, there are a great many structures which we have investigated. This is not a topic of today. Um, I showed you just you one example to prove kind of that, that this actually works. Uh, this is a conductance measurement we had performed uh, back in the times at ETH Zurich, which simply shows that, yes, indeed, one of these, um, these conductors can operate in the strongly interacting regime, uh, in the sort of, sorry, in the, uh, um, the single-mode regime where we see uh, essentially quantized conductance, exactly as you have uh, with, uh, with single-mode quantum wires. If you're interested, I cite, uh, I mentioned here two uh, articles, in particular a review article which, which describes all these experiments uh, uh, that were performed uh, at ETH Zurich. But, but keep in mind that this protocol of, of measuring transport, where basically you have um, two, two clouds of atoms that are connected by a channel, right? And the current is, consists in atoms going from one reservoir to the other. Uh, by going through uh, this this uh, uh, this channel, which again has may, may have any property you might be able to implement, right? So so this is the the, the very simple ID, and of course the the way uh, to measure transport um, as we were doing in the past uh, in this experiment I, I just mentioned is that we are simply taking absorption pictures, so counting atoms on one side and in the other, um, and then. If we want, want to know how this evolves in time, we actually have to prepare another sample and then compare it with the previous one after a different time evolution. So, so this is, of course, a bit tedious, but it also introduces a lot of bias uh, uh, and noise, basically, because you have to compare one sample to the next. And if you, if you had to, de to design a transport measurement uh, without any technical constraint, you would actually never do that. What you would do is, is you would design a system which actually looks at uh, some interface in space and just counts and looks sort of in real time at uh, atoms going back and forth through this interface. But what you don't want is to average from one sample to the next. Um, so, uh, and that, that led us to uh, uh, a theory proposal that, that actually makes use of cavity QED method, uh, starting from the, the very simple idea that uh, 
Cavity QED is the uh, system canoni which is canonical if you're interested in measurements and in the limits of, of quantum measurement. Right? Uh, and, and so this is the concept. You have one uh, reservoir uh, which is overlapped with the cavity mode and you interrogate this cavity continuously uh, in such a way that uh, in the dispersive regime, so I wrote just the Hamiltonian here, uh, the, the phase of the light field gives you information essentially on how many atoms you have within the, uh, the mode of the cavity. And, and in this context, it's easy to see that uh, if you are able to monitor this in real time, then you will reconstruct the full time evolution of atom numbers. You have access basically to the full counting statistics. Um, so that's very appealing, uh, and what we've investigated is basically how well this, this could ever work. Um, so there are different limitations, uh, different limitations of, of different nature. Uh, the first one, which is semi-trivial, is, is the spontaneous emission. That is the fact that if you send light onto a cloud, even if you're in the dispersive regime, atoms may actually scatter uh, the photons. Uh, that is something we don't worry too much about. It's simply because the, the high finesse cavity takes care of that. Uh, in a sense that if your cooperativity is high enough, then you, you can be sure that these spontaneous emission effects are dominated by the measurement back action itself. So, so that, that's one side uh, which actually to calls for using a cavity. Uh, and the second part, of course, is, is a fundamental um, limitation, which is the measurement back action itself. Uh, in other words, that's the effect of the quantum fluctuation of light uh, onto the cloud itself. And that gives rise, for example, to heating. So that, that's really something which is detrimental for, for measurement. And this is something which, uh, which can be calculated uh, once you've realized how the uh, vacuum fluctuation actually coupled to the cloud. It's possible to do a many body calculation and calculate the heating rate for all interaction strengths. Uh, it's possible, it's something which was done by, by my uh, uh, colleague Shun Uchino uh, uh, in, in Japan. This is not very easy, uh, but there one makes use uh, of TANS relation and the fact that some properties, at least at short range, are known regardless of interaction strengths. Uh, and, and the result here of the heating rate is expressed in terms of a few universal functions which are tabulated in this paper. Uh, they are sort of calculated once for all. And there's one message, I mean, I see that I've been speaking for, for quite some time now. Um, th the main take-home message I want to show um, is that the result of the calculation, um, which is uh, shown here, is this heating rate as a function of the different parameters. Um, the important point is that uh, the heating rate can be made as small as we want if we take a narrow enough cavity. And that is something that is valid regardless of the interaction strength. So in other words, um, even if you have the strongest possible interaction in your system, it's a very complex uh, dynamics. You're not able to calculate it uh, by any uh, reasonable mean. We can be sure that uh, there are parameter regimes, in particular uh, regimes where the cavity is narrow. So that's uh, what the, 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 the bottom axis represents here. So low value of this, uh, this parameter means narrow cavity, in particular sub-recoil cavity. Um, that's a regime where regardless of interaction, you can work so of in, in the, the Q and D regime. So it's possible to do weakly destructive measurements uh, for all interaction strengths. That's one very important message, uh, which means that this, uh, this device has actually a chance to work even in regimes which are interesting, that is the ones for which we don't know the dynamics. Uh, and then we are left with the last limitation uh, to take into account, which is rather obvious, in, if, if you have in mind uh, that we want to measure transport, is simply the fact that there is back action of the, of the uh, uh, measurement on the transport on the current itself. <clears throat> and again, the, the, the math is pretty easy. You just have to write down what the current operator actually is. And current is simply the derivative of atom number uh, uh, with time, so atom number in one of the reservoirs uh, with respect to time. Um, and, and now you realize that um, if you are actually ma making a projective measurement of atom number in one of the reservoirs, you are fixing the atom number, and therefore the current has to be zero. So if you are following in real time uh, the current fluctu the, the atom number fluctuation in one reservoir, you actually necessarily have a back action onto the current itself. 
And the manifestation of this, and, and there we follow really the standard uh, derivation of the standard quantum limit for, uh, for example, position measurements, uh, is simply some imperfect, uh, uh, um, in, imprecision noise that's added by the measurement uh, on top of the, uh, the current you're measuring. And, and you have a very standard form where you have a competition between one term describing photon shot noise in the interferometer. So in other words, the finite amount of information you gather by sending a finite amount of light. And, and the second term here, uh, which describes the actual measurement back action on the current and the noise spectrum uh, that this gives rise to. And the expressions are rather transparent. Uh, the calculation is presented uh, in our publication. I don't want to, uh, to enter uh, too much details here, but, but I'm happy to answer questions on this uh, later if you, if you have. So um, this is very promising uh, because it means that uh, we can actually hope by combining ultra-cold fermions with, with, with cavity QED um, to perform transport measurement that's essentially as good as permitted by quantum mechanics. If they are limited by this actual back action mechanism. So we can really hope to do super high precision transport uh, transport measurement and solve some puzzles you may have uh, with, with, for example, how interacting system flows uh, in mesoscopic devices. And that's one possible application for this setup, which we are foreseeing. And I should also say that Quantitatively, the, the cavity we have is very narrow, so it is actually a regime which is very favorable for this kind of non-destructive measurements. Um, so that's that. That's everything I wanted to say. Um, so let me summarize uh, the different uh, aspects I, I have mentioned. Um, I presented to you this uh, experimental setup, which combines uh, strongly interacting fermions and a high finesse cavity, and I have shown you the. Um, and the first demonstration of a strongly correlated Fermi gas uh, coupled with light. So this is something which, which will actually appear uh, pretty soon in nature communications. Um, and then I showed you uh, some of these uh, uh, preliminary results which we have when we try to actually couple photons not to the atoms themselves, but directly to the Cooper pairs. And this is something which we are pursuing at the moment, which we are very excited about. Uh, and last, I mentioned this, this theory pro proposal in which we think we can actually use this system to perform very high precision transport measurement uh, in the future. With that, um, um, there are many perspectives. Um, you can think of them in different categories. One which we are uh, going to pursue further is what is, is to do many body physics with atoms and photons, because now we have strong atom atom and strong atom photon interaction at the same time. Uh, and there are many things which we would like to do, in particular, use the photons to mediate extra interaction between the atoms. This is something which has been heavily investigated for bosons so far, uh, but not really for fermions, at least not experimentally. Um, there is another uh, uh, perspective a bit in the spirit of this last proposal I showed you, which is the quantum limits to quantum simulation. In particular, how well could you ever measure a complex many-body system as it evolves in time? And does this place limitations on our ability to actually use quantum simulation to learn things uh, on many-body systems? And, and, and one last point, which I mentioned because I really no idea about it, but, but some of you might, might actually uh, um, have ideas on this, is, is our, our quantum gases, they, they have their strong correlations sort of um, by default. So you just need to cool them and the correlations appear, emerge as, as, as the, uh, we cross phase transitions. But, but can we now, now that we have this, this interface to light, is it possible, for example, to use these correlations in order to generate uh, lights or photons with, with interesting correlations? Um, I have no clue about that, uh, but that might actually be something uh, worth the, the investigation. So with that, uh, let me thank the team uh, who work in the group at, uh, here in Lausanne. So the, the results I presented to you are mainly due to uh, um, the, uh, the Fermi gas uh, team. So the work on this experiment I presented, so Kevin Roux, uh, uh, Victor Helson and uh, Timo Zwettler, who joined us recently. These are PhD students on the experiment. And Hideki Konishi is a postdoc uh, who worked with us as well. We have another lab that's being built, uh, mainly on microscopy. I, I will not discuss that now. And I would like also to thank uh, my theory collaborators, uh, Shunuchino and Masahito Ueda. 
Uh, and also many people with whom we have discussed, both on the cavity QED aspect, but also uh, for fermions and for particular molecular physics, which we are learning now. Uh, and we benefited a lot from discussions, particular with Paul Julian. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank you for watching. And thanks again for the, for the invitation. I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, that was a beautifully clear talk. Um, so we do already have a couple of questions from the audience. I have a few questions as well. I'm sure there will be more questions as well from the audience. Yes, they're already coming in. So don't be afraid to ask, guys. Um, so let me start with a question from Amitava Banerjee. So this was asked kind of uh, sort of halfway through the talk, so I think you already touched on, on this a bit. But um, she uh, asks, uh, is there any way the transmission spectrum can probe the collective many-body state of the lithium atoms and reveal, for example, correlations or amount of entanglement in them? Um, yes, yeah, so, so okay, um, I, I, I hope I showed you at least one particular way by which this can be done, which is to, to address photo association transition, which is directly measuring the, um, the, um, the pair correlations at short distance. So that's, that's one possibility. Um, now, uh, what we would like to do in the future uh, is to go in the dispersive regime. So not looking at the absorption spectrum, which, which you have seen, and, and there are indeed features, but, but if you look at things like, for example, noise, uh, and I alluded a bit to that in the last part, uh, if you go into the dispersive regime and look at the noise spectrum, there, there certainly are signatures of, of the strongly interacting nature uh, of, the, of the gas. Uh, I cannot point you directly at, uh, uh, at one specific feature, um, but in some sense, you can think that the, um, the noise spectrum on the cavity field will act a little bit like Bragg spectroscopy, that is, it will it will be sort of the the reaction of the fluctuation of the of the atoms at the different frequencies, and that should map onto the phase of the field. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so we have a question from Don Gould, uh, who was getting very excited during the talk. I think he really appreciated it. So he says, "Excellent talk, wonderful experiments." Um, connect, connected to the previous question, um, more specifically, could the cavity field be used to probe single particle correlation function of the gas and hence the momentum distribution? Um, I guess what you were just saying is sort of connected to that, right? Yeah, so single particles, um, I guess, okay, so so um, the problem is is that, that that's actually something which is which our new experiment will address the microscope lab, but uh, um, at the moment, of course, if you have the cavity, you lose any kind of space information. So you cannot say uh, sort of where the atoms go and so on. Uh, so if you want to get information on the momentum, one way I see is simply to use the, the photon recoils. So basically the fact that there is a lattice structure underlying the, in, in the cavity mode. And therefore, uh, the phase fluctuation which enter the cavity, they couple to the atoms via this, this, this sort of lattice fluctuation. You can think of it like this. This is actually how we calculated the heating rate. Now, whether this is actually what you're asking, uh, like really single particle properties, I, I cannot see right now. Uh, I cannot. I cannot uh, answer positively and give you a protocol. But but that might be extremely interesting, actually. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, I'll just uh, also switch on my video so I'm back in the conversation. Um, yeah. So um, we have another question from. Uh, Christophe Gaillond, I hope I just pronounced your name semi-correctly. Uh, does the transmission spectra depend on the laser probe power? Could this be used to quantify polariton-polariton interaction strength, like for semiconductors? Um, okay, so so you have in mind the the, um, the 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 semiconductor physics experiment in which uh, in which the um, the polaritons are created by the photons you send, and therefore there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between laser power and and polariton densities. I mean, here this is slightly different. So what all the probe we have been doing so far um, is in the weekly inter in the weak saturation regime, right? So, so we really suppose that the atoms absorb light independently of each other and independently of previously sent photons. Now, if we send more power, what we gon what's going to happen is that we're going to saturate the atomic transition, so we're going to get a nonlinear response, but it's, a, it's essentially nonlinear optics which we are going to do. 
Um, the the atom atom interaction and the light matter interaction um, they are kind of living in two different worlds in our experiment. The light matter interaction um, for resonant photons gives rise to Rabi frequencies of the order of 100 megahertz. Right. So so these are very very fast process. Um, atom atom interaction or particle interactions uh, they live at the scale of the Fermi energy. Uh, which in our case is typically 50 kilohertz. So you have three orders of magnitude difference between the two. Um, so actually, th there's no analogy in that respect with the semiconductor polariton, I think. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so um, I have a couple, I'd, uh, maybe we can wait a bit to see if more questions come in. In the meantime, uh, I have a couple of things I was curious about. So um, first of all, and at the end of the talk, you kind of already touched on this a bit, but the, the possibility of having light induced interactions, right? So I guess one thing which I'm sure has probably been studied a lot theoretically, um, but maybe not experimentally is um, inducing superfluidity via the, the cavity, right? I mean, there should be an attractive interaction there. What would be the, the kind of prospects for, for actually achieving this in your setup? Um, so, so that's that's clearly one of the one of the things which is on the top of the list. Um, I should say um, I, I've not seen published, but but perhaps that that's just my own ignorance. Uh, an actual protocol where you would clearly see a light-induced superfluidity. Um, the, the 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 main f attractive I mean, the, the, um, why would this be super interesting is because the the light matter interaction doesn't discriminate between spins. So in particular, if you manage to cook up a, a light-induced interaction between fermions, um, that actually means you can get P-wave superfluidity. Uh, and that, of course, has a lot of implications, and that would actually be, be, be super cool. Uh, but as far as I know, um, there is nothing, at least nothing that, direct, that we can directly map onto our experiment. I know that there has been some investigations of this. Uh, I, I, can, I can give the name of Corinna Collat for sure. Uh, and they have looked at, at how pairing could occur, and I know they, are, they, they have published a few theoretical papers, but at least if we want to map this onto our experiment, um, we, that would require quite some technical uh, development, even though the cavity uh, is there and the fermions are there. So, so we just need to have a, a, an actual implementable protocol at hand. Um, this is certainly something which we would love to do, right? I see. Okay, so there's room for some theoretical work on a, on a practical proposal for your setup then. That's very interesting. Um, so, uh, okay, we have a couple more questions now from the audience. So, um, Paolo uh, Molignini asks, are there any limitations in your setup to add optical lattices, for example, to achieve the quantum simulation of strongly interacting lattice models with cavity-mediated interactions? Um, the, okay, we have optical access in order to add extra laser beam for the lattice. The, the, the experiment was designed to have this possibility. Um, I would say now one limitation is, of course, that then, you know, we've already spent three years in, in getting there and adding another three-dimensional lattice. Uh, I'm not sure everybody would be super enthusiastic to, to spend another six months doing that. Um, and, and I think there's one key question in, in there is whether in the particular model you have in mind, you need to have the lattice, the, sort of the optical lattice, exactly commensurate with the cavity. Because the cavity has the mode structure of the cavity is a lattice itself, and if you need to not if you need to create a lattice that has exactly the same period and exactly the same phase, um, that's actually quite challenging. Now, if you just need to put a lattice and it doesn't really matter how the phase matching works, that's much much easier. And what could what could really think about it uh, at the time scale of, of six months or a year? I mean, that, that's typically what it would take in terms of, of uh, amount of, of work. Great, thanks. Um, I, I just realized I've actually missed a question from, from uh, Jakob Zagrzewski, um, who asks, uh, what about bosons, for example, lithium-7 uh, in the cavity? Um, so we've, uh, of course, we focused on the, on the fermions. Um, well, I think we would need to buy another uh, set of, of lasers in order to put, to put lithium-7 in addition. I mean, technically, it would look very much the same, right? Uh, we just uh, don't have any plan to work uh, on the bosons also because to some extent the bosonic, uh, I mean ultra cold bosons coupled to cavities this is something which has been already heavily investigated um, there are wonderful experiments uh, in Stanford, at ETH Zurich in, in, in Hamburg and so on um, 
So our main inclin inclination at the moment is to look for, for sort of fermionic things uh, to look at. Makes sense. Um, thanks. So uh, Tony Apolaro asks, um, first of all, thanks for the great talk. I was wondering if the photon mediated interaction can be made long range by using a magnetic gradient so that atoms have different resonances. Um, the, the photon mediated interaction, so this, that's the one you would have in the dispersive regime. So I didn't discuss that in, that in, in the experiment because we, we are not there yet, but um, the, the, it's actually already long range interaction. Uh, and the reason is simply that, that um, because the, the, the cavity field covers the entire cloud, as soon as an atom does something to the cavity field, that thing is seen by every other. Right, so so by construction, this interaction is is infinitely is infinite range. What's not so easy is if you want to actually turn this interaction into a medium range interaction. Uh, indeed, one could think of of using a magnetic field gradient. Uh, there, one need to think about it in a clever way because that will have huge mechanical effects on the cloud. Um, so so one needs to check that you can do that. Um, that sort of significantly changes over space the, the interaction strength, but that doesn't completely kill the, uh, the atoms themselves. Uh, but, but one could think about this, yes. I mean, we, we didn't think about it very deeply, I should say. Thank you. Uh, so have another, we have a question from uh, Mauro Paternostro, um, who asks, can one think of a complementary situation to the measuring transport scheme and work in the regime where the cavity affects the atoms and controls transport through light and measurement. Yes, that would actually be awesome. Uh, I think, uh, well, to, to, to some extent, if you go, okay, what I described, which is very, very sort of basic linear response kind of analysis, um, if you go in the regime of strong back action, this is effectively what you have, because the, the as you project your reservoir onto uh, various atom numbers, you are inducing noise uh, in the bias, if you want, uh, and that actually triggering uh, um, some, some extra current. So that's the sort of obvious thing I have in mind. But now there are more clever schemes on the market. Um, for example, um, all processes by which you have photon-assisted tunneling. The protocol is slightly different, but if you think of an optical lattice in which you photo assist tunneling from one side to the next, then one obvious thing, and I think that was that was discussed in particular by Peter Zoller a couple of years ago, is that if, if you are using cavity photons to induce tunneling, then basically the measurement back action is going to control the way transport takes place. Right? Because as soon as you do a measurement of the cavity photons, then you're projecting uh, onto one particular, uh, you're, you're basically inducing hopping, irreversible hopping in the lattice. So I, I would look in this direction uh, for protocols in which transport is controlled directly by the, by the cavity field. Thanks, uh, that's really interesting. Um, so um, if anyone has any last questions, feel free to go ahead. I'm going to ask one more thing that I was just curious about. Um, in the same kind of vein, so asking about this kind of transport and continuous measurements. Um, as you probably know, I mean, in mesoscopics and electronics, um, a really big problem there is measuring energy currents, right? It's hard to measure energy currents. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you've thought about some way of, of having energy resolved measurements of current or energy current measurements directly with your kind of scheme. Um, okay, so, so energy itself, um, it, I don't think we can keep track of energy uh, actually with the protocol we have now. But what we could do is, is uh, keep track of temperature. So, so if we think of the very long time scale and, and we think that the reservoirs are actually at thermal equilibrium, that's a bit in the spirit of what we did with, with thermal power. Um, then uh, what we've seen is, is that if you look, for example, at these pair correlations, the, 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 the strength of pair correlation depend on temperature. So you could easily imagine that, that you get a signal out of your cavity, which carries not only an information on the total atom number, but also on the strengths of pair correlations, which you might be able to trace back to, to temperature. Uh, now, of course, in all these measurements, and that includes any uh, two terminal measurement we had performed in the past at, at ETH Zurich, the underlying hypothesis is that um, we had thermal equilibrium in the reservoirs at all point in time. So, so we can, so energy, basically mapping onto energy um, essentially means measuring temperature. 
Uh, because if you go beyond that, you're actually not even sure whether what you measure is actually conductance or, or not the internal dynamics of the reservoir, for example. So there one needs any way to be careful. Uh, but, but there might be other possibilities, which, which I, I, of course, I didn't think of. Thanks very much. That's interesting. Um, yeah, so I think that's, well, we've had a huge number of questions and interest there. Also, lots of virtual clapping in the YouTube chat, by the way, and lots of thank yous from everyone. So I think we'll probably conclude there. Um, and just let me say thank you so much again, John philippe for a beautiful talk. That was really, really great um, and much appreciated. Um, and thanks again, of course, to everyone for, for tuning in. Um, yeah. And we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot and, and stay safe all. Thanks.